So the first thing I have to tell you, just to warn you, is that I love data. So you'll see a lot of data in this talk. Um, my wife loves to tell the story about the time that she asked me, uh, why are all these people being invited to dinner? Why did you put these people together? And I said, they all love data. You can imagine how her eyes rolled when I told her that. And she wondered whether that would actually be a fun dinner party, having people who love data. Uh, well, it was, of course, uh, because people who love data are fun people. Um, so there will, <laughs> yes, actually, lots of fun. Uh, when I was a kid, I actually wrote a letter. About 10 years old, we went to uh, New York City, and I wrote a letter back to one of my aunts in which I said, uh, we saw 10 grocery stores, we saw five uh, fire stations, we saw three Chinese restaurants, and it went on in that vein. My wife discovered this letter one day, and she just was running around the house showing everybody in my household this letter about, uh, this is what your father did as a kid. Look at him. He was that way when he was 10 years old. So I count things. But that turns out to be useful right now, because counting things is the way you actually decide an election. So what I'm going to try to do is show you some ways we can figure out who's going to win that election. I'm going to try to do the following things. This is a lot for one talk. I think I can get through most of it, and I may have to hurry at some point. First, how to predict a presidential election. So I'll actually give you a prediction. Then I want to talk about polarization in American politics, which is a real problem in America right now. Then I want to talk about this lovely thing we have coming up January, February, March, the fiscal cliff, uh, which could be really a problem for the American political economy. And then I just can't forbear but say something about Proposition 30 because it turns out to be so important for the University of California. And it also is another uh, illustration of the problems of polarization, although in this case in California. So uh, the, the Prop 30 stuff is actually in the way of a paid political ad where we're trying to talk a little bit about how support your local university. Um, how to predict a presidential election. If you study stocks, you know that there's the folks who study the fundamentals. And the way they try to figure out what the value of stocks is going to be, they say, well, look at the economy over time and try to correlate that with the economy. And that's the way to figure out what happens with stocks. But then there's the technical specialists. And what they do is they look at the bumps and wiggles of the stock price day by day. And the technicians uh, really try to look for little bitty changes and see if they can't figure out how to make money that way. Well, it turns out there's a group of people who use the fundamentals to try to predict elections. And there's a group of people who use the technical analysis of polls. Uh, most famously right now, Nate Silver at 538 blog. And I'll mention Nate uh, as we go along. And then, oh, by the way, there is a betting and stock trading market out there that you can go to uh, in trade. And you can actually bet on the presidential election. And I'll say what that seems to lead to in terms of predictions. So let's start with this uh, fundamentals. Well, what are the fundamentals for an election? I've listed a bunch. First, it's the economy, stupid. It's clearly important what happens in the economy. All of these different measures here are different measures of the state of the economy. By the way, we're going to get one tomorrow morning at 5.30 our time. I will be up to look, uh, which are going to be the jobs numbers, uh, which will be, I think, somewhat important. Not enormously important, but will have maybe a small impact, especially given how close the election is. So there's a whole bunch of different measures of the economy. Incumbency is important. Just turns out being an incumbent is a valuable asset, and Barack Obama is lucky to have it right now. Without it, he would certainly not be leading, uh, as I will show you, uh, in the race for the presidency. War and US military facilities matter. If they're going down, that's helpful to an incumbent president. If they're going up, that's hurtful. So Barack Obama is favored by that. He's brought fatalities down. And then some people in these models uh, add candidate strength two months before. This is a little bit like cheating because you're sort of using how strong were they two months ago, and that's obviously going to be a pretty good predictor of how strong they're going to be in the election. Uh, so it's a bit of a fudge factor, but at least you can argue that's something that happens before the election, so it's something you can rely upon to try to predict the election. So these factors are taken by different researchers and put into statistical models. They look at past performance, past results, using these factors figure out who was seemed to be advantaged by them, who wasn't, and how they all figure together to help predict who becomes president. And then they use those factors to try to predict who's going to become the president in this round. So PS, Political Science and Politics, which is a, a magazine published by the American Political Science Association. Actually, I shouldn't call it a magazine. It's a journal. 
to journal. I, I, I once, my poor father, who was a carpet salesman and did not go to college, uh, he visited me once. And about the fourth day, I was getting really nervous. I had to get back to work. And we're sitting at lunch, and, and my poor, wonderful father says to me, Henry, tell me about this magazine you published in. And I said, Dad, it's a journal. <laughs> Embarrassing moment in retrospect, but nevertheless, uh, so it's a journal. Um, my father is gone, but I'm sure he remembers the moment. And I, I, the poor man was completely confused about why I was making such a di big, big deal about the difference between a journal and a magazine. In fact, he probably thought it was better to publish in a magazine, and he's probably right. OK, so in this journal, 10 models were put forth that used national electoral data. So what they looked at was Obama's share of the two-party vote presuming that if he gets more than 50%, that'll translate into an electoral college victory. That's an assumption. Uh, and if he gets less than 50%, he will lose. So a political scientist, because we're an exact science and we can predict the future and so forth, we came up with models that predicted both that Obama would win and that Obama would lose. So we have complete certainty that one of those two things will occur. The models went from 47.5% Obama two-party share of the vote to 53.8%. So that's pretty wide range. However, in, of the 10 models, in six of them, the authors predicted Obama would win, and in four of them, Romney would win. So we get about a 60% chance that Obama would win. There's also three models in this same journal that looked at state-by-state -state data. And of those three models, two predicted Obama would win and one that Romney would win. So 67% chance Obama would win. So that's the fundamentals. The fundamentals suggest Obama should win, given the fundamentals of the economy, incumbency, the war in Afghanistan and in Iraq in the past, and so forth. The other approach I mentioned that's really important is technical analysis of polls. And here I'm going to start with a website called Real Clear Politics. Many of you may have gone there. It's one of these aggregation sites. It puts together a whole lot of different national polls, and it averages them. And then it even uses them state by state to try to predict what will happen in the states. Currently, November 1st, the national polls are tied, according to Real Clear Politics. I pulled this off the website this morning. By the way, it may have already been updated. So this, if you go there right now, it might be slightly different. But it, as of this morning, it was tied. Uh, by the way, Obama was at 49.1% and Romney at 46% on October 2nd. Why do I pick that date? Quiz. It's just before the first debate. And remember, that was a bad moment for Barack Obama. So you can see that he's really gone down in the polls. But of course, the popular vote isn't really the fundamental thing. In the end, it's the state-by-state -state vote. So real clear politics says that right now there are enough states that are solid Obama that he should get 201 electoral votes, and Romney will get 191. You got to get 270 to win. So there's 146 toss-ups according to Real Clear Politics. Now I start with Real Clear Politics because it's, it's little c conservative in the sense that they, they really are just an aggregator. They just average the polls in a pretty straightforward way. And they try not to use very sophisticated statistical models like some other people, like Nate Silver and some other people I'll mention. Uh, and they do this uh, partly, I think, because uh, they believe that's just a simple, straightforward way to present the data. But it also turns out, actually, Real Clear Politics gets a bunch of funding from conservatives who are actually happy with this kind of result for the following reason. If you take various electoral vote totals according to a bunch of folks out there who are prognosticators, real clear politics is the lowest in terms of Obama electoral votes and not the highest in terms of Romney, but the difference between the two is the smallest of any of the people I've listed here. So they have that there's about 10 electoral votes difference between Obama and Romney. The rest of these all have more than that as a difference. And indeed, as you go down the table, the difference between the two gets bigger and bigger. Uh, I put in here Stuart Rothenberg, uh, he's a well-known commentator on politics, uh, Nate Silver, the 538 blog, uh, Charlie Cook, another well-known commentator, 
Uh, Sam Wang, who's not as well known, he runs the Princeton Election Project and does some very interesting things with the data, and then pollster.com, which is the Huffington Post. So notice you get quite a range here uh, on toss-ups and so forth. By the way, by pollster.com, you've got 71 electoral vote difference between the two candidates. And notice, pollster.com is the only one that sort of says Obama's going to win for sure. This 277, there's still 55 toss-ups, but it doesn't matter once you get to 277. Okay, so now let's look at more detail about Real Clear Politics and what it's doing. Uh, they've got 11 battleground states. These are the states where the campaign is really contested. I put them in uh, an order, so I go from west to east because here from California, that's the way we look at the country. We go from west to east, not the media biased approach of starting in the east and going west. And what I've done here is I've listed these 11 battleground states, and then next to them I put letters for one of the prognosticators indicating that that state is a battleground state from their perspective. So all 11 of these are real clear politics battleground states, but these other folks I just mentioned may not agree with that. And by the way, there's no prognosticator that has battleground states beyond these 11. So this is the full universe, if you will. And notice, Colorado, everybody agrees that's a, a battleground state, all five of my prognosticators. Um, Michigan, none of the other folks think that's a battleground state, nor do I, by the way. And same thing with Pennsylvania. So what I do, so let's just highlight those. There they are. Uh, Obama, in terms of real clear politics, leads by about three percentage points on average in Michigan and about 4.6 percentage points in Pennsylvania. So I think those two states are almost certainly going to go for Obama. So I'm going to give those 36 electoral, this is fun, by the way. You two can do this. You can give the electoral votes to people and make your own president. Uh, so these 36 I give to Obama. So you remember it was 201 a moment ago. Now it's 237. So and still 191 for Romney. Uh, and so there's the modified approach where I've deleted Michigan and Pennsylvania. Now what I do is I note that some of these are even more contested according to the prognosticators than others. In other words, the ones with three or more raters who rated them as toss-ups, I put in green. And that's Colorado, Iowa, Ohio, Florida, Virginia, and New Hampshire. Those are the real toss-ups. And the ones that are really, really toss-ups are Colorado, Ohio, Florida, Virginia, New Hampshire, uh, maybe not Iowa so much. but. Um, so that'll give you some idea of which ones are the real, real toss-ups. And in fact, here's another way to look at it. Uh, take those states that I indicated have a lot of raters saying they're really, really toss-ups, and look at what the difference is between Obama and Romney in those states. So Colorado, for example, is deemed really, really a toss-up, and Obama is leading by 0.6 percent. That's a toss-up. That's a toss-up. Iowa, 2.0%, Ohio, 2.3%, Florida, 1.2%, and so forth. That's Romney leading in Florida, though, uh, and Virginia Romney leading. So the net results, all states rated as toss-ups by three or more raters have 2.3% lead or less. In other words, it really is close. So that's just another way to get at it, that those really, really, really are the toss-up states. So that gives you some sense of the political geography of what's going on uh, in the United States and where the battle is really being joined. Uh, OK, so I just said a moment ago I took out Michigan and Pennsylvania, gave Obama the 36 electoral votes. And so Obama has 237, Romney 191. Then what I do is I go through these and I allocate electoral votes in terms of who's ahead right now. And the net result is when I do that, so Colorado goes to Obama, Nevada goes to Obama, Iowa to Obama, blah, blah, blah. Florida goes to Romney, North Carolina to Romney. and. I get that Obama has 290, Romney 248. That's obviously an Obama win. Notice that Romney must have Florida. Florida's very close right now, 1.2%. It could conceivably go for Obama. Uh, if Romney doesn't get Florida, that's 29 electoral votes. And it's almost impossible for Romney to win the presidency without Florida. Now, it's likely it'll go for him, but that's the first thing to look for on election night is what's happening in in Florida. Um, the other thing then to look at is Ohio, as everybody's been saying. 
Uh, notice that if Obama doesn't get Ohio, according to this calculation, he'll have 272 electoral votes. 290 minus 18 is 272. That's still enough to win, but it's not a comfortable margin, and it would mean he'd have to get all the other states that I'm presuming he would get here. Uh, and so he could easily lose if he doesn't get Ohio. He could still win, but he could easily lose. So Ohio is really important for Obama. Got to win that one, probably. Uh, okay, so what are the conclusion here about the first part of my talk, which is about predicting presidential elections? The fundamentals say there's about a two-thirds chance Obama will win. The technical analysis I've just gone through, if you actually go to all these websites, they give you a, a an estimate, uh, Nate Silver was at about 79% this morning, and somebody told me earlier today it was up to 81%. Um, the about three-quarter chance, 75%, I would say, on average, that Obama will win, according to these prognosticators. And then, by the way, in trade, it's trading such that there's about a two-thirds chance Obama will win. So these converge pretty well. Now, if you're an Obama supporter, you might say, oh, that's great. Looks like Obama's going to win. Well, be careful. If your doctor came to you and said, here's the news, you got a two-thirds chance of, of, of winning uh, this battle against this dreaded disease, but you got a one-third chance of losing, you wouldn't think that was a good situation to be in. One-third would sound like a big probability of bad things happening. So Obama supporters probably should not be too enthusiastic about this kind of prediction. This is a very close race with a real chance, it says, that we could run the election three times, and in one of those three times, Romney would be president, and two of them, Obama would be president. So it's not like it's a slam dunk for Barack Obama by any means. It's obviously in his favor. Uh, you'd rather be in Obama's position than Romney's position, but it's not a slam dunk. Uh, Nate Silver, by the way, I give you his prediction down there as well. Okay, uh, just to, to tell you, this is from Charlie Cook, but it's really pretty consensus right now. The sense is the Senate will stay Democratic with about 52 Democrats, two independents. The independents probably will caucus. Certainly Bernie Saunders will caucus with the Democrats. It's not clear what the senator from Maine will do uh, if uh, he wins, and he probably will. Uh, and that could mean as many as 54 senators who are Democrats. Uh, but the Senate will probably stay Democratic. The House will certainly stay Republican. There's no question. I think it's less than 1% chance it won't. So Obama barely wins as president and a divided Congress most likely. Republican House, Democratic Senate. Okay, let me shift gears a little bit. How did we get here? What's going on? Well, here's, I like numbers, but I like art too. Uh, this is Sandy Calder, and, and when I put this up, Sometimes people say, oh, you've got it backwards and reverse because look, the, uh, the, the signature's wrong. Well, I actually did that on purpose, and here's why. Think of this as being a diagram in which we locate people in a political space. And along the horizontal axis, we've got liberal to conservative. And along the vertical axis, we've got liberal to conservative on another issue. So let's say the horizontal axis is your position on economic issues redistribution, for example. And if you believe in redistribution, you're on the left. And if you're against redistribution, you're on the right. And then let's assume the vertical axis is social issues, gay marriage, abortion, prayer in the schools, things like that, with liberals down towards the bottom, conservatives towards the top. And now let's look at where most Democrats will be. And given that description, they're going to be in the left bottom corner. And conservatives, because they're not in favor of redistribution and they're not in favor of abortion or gay rights, will be in the upper right-hand corner. Well, this wonderful picture, turns out, uh, tells you about American politics because the convention right now the networks use is that Democrats are coded as blue, Republicans are coded as red. By the way, do you know why that's so? They wanted to do red, white, and blue, and white, of course, doesn't work so well, so you got, you're left with red and blue. But if you call the Democrats red, that'll look like an editorial comment, right? Because they're red, the reds, like communists. Uh, so the networks purposely decided to code Democrats as blue because they thought nobody would mind uh, if the Republicans were reds, although there are Republicans who are annoyed by this. 
I actually have a colleague who's quite conservative and who refuses to code the Democrats anything but red. He, by the way, once held, and this is true, the Ken Lay, Ken Lay, Chair of Business Administration at the University of Houston. Ken Lay, you may remember, well, anyway, Enron, all that. So, so this picture tells you about American politics. We've got the Democrats on the left, Republicans in the upper right, and we've got this big line between them. Polarization in America is depicted by this picture. So Sandy Calder, Alexander Calder, my favorite artist, there's a wonderful stable of his in front of the art museum, just down that way, I guess. Uh, probably turned around, maybe it's down that way. It's down that way, yes, thank you. Um, and uh, here it is, it's just remarkable. I don't, by the way, know what some of this other stuff is on the diagram, but we can extend the metaphor later in the question and answer period. Um, okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the parties, and this diagram needs a little bit of explanation. Take our country and break it up into quintiles, five groups. The lowest quintile are people with low education and, high, and low income. The upper fifth quintile is people with high education and high income, and in between have gradations, so you know, medium and so on and so forth. So that's the five groups along the bottom, from low education and income to high education and income. Then, indicate what percentage of each quintile are Democrats and which percentage of each quintile are Republicans. And what you notice immediately is, and let's focus on Republicans to begin with, there's a very low fraction of Republicans in the bottom quintiles. There's a lot of Republicans in the upper quintiles. By the way, the Republican line is below the Democratic line because there's more Democrats than Republicans. So on average, there's fewer Republicans than Democrats. That's all that's going on there. But the important thing is to look at the slope of that line for Republicans and notice there's a really higher fraction of Republicans who are in the upper quintile, who have high education, high income. Democrats are the reverse. But not completely the reverse, because you notice the Democratic line is not so steeply sloped. And in fact, we can come to this conclusion that for Democrats, 47% come from the bottom two quintiles. Now, quintiles are constructed so each one is a fifth of the population. So the bottom two quintiles comprises 40% of the population. And there's 47% of Democrats come from those quintiles. So that means they're overrepresented in the bottom two quintiles, but not by a lot. And 35% percent, which is less than the 40 percent you'd expect if they were randomly chosen, come from the top two quintiles. So Democrats are more likely to be low education and low income, but not by an enormous amount. Republicans, on the other hand, are much more highly concentrated in the top two quintiles, 51 percent, and 27, only 27 percent from the bottom two quintiles. This basic set of facts about American political parties are, is really important. They're really important facts. They tell you, and something you probably knew, the Republicans are the party of the rich and the well-off. The Democrats are the party of the not so well-off. But furthermore, and more importantly, the Republicans are a more homogeneous party. They're more homogeneously the party of the rich and well-off, whereas the Democrats are more heterogeneous. Yes, they're the party of low income, low education, but they've actually got representation across the board. This means that Republicans are in a nice position because they can represent a pretty homogeneous constituency, rich people. Democrats have a harder time because they have to represent poor people and rich people. And so that's a basic political fact about American politics. And that means that Republicans can be more strident in their dislike of taxes than Democrats can be strident with respect to some of the issues they care about like spending. So that's deep in the genetics, or the, the, the DNA of the two parties. OK, now let me look at the parties in a different way. And we're about, by the way, to get to my Jackson Pollock period as an artist. In fact, I'll, I'll give you, there it is. That's the Jackson Pollock period. Uh, it'll come up in just a minute. Um, let's think of those two dimensions I mentioned a moment ago, income 
and economic issues on the one hand. So income or religious attendance are sort of sociological facts about people. And it turns out income is correlated with where you stand on economic issues. Rich people don't like taxes. Poor people like redistribution and services. Uh, religious attendance is correlated with social moral issues. People who attend church more tend to be more conservative on abortion, gay rights, and so forth. So these are two basic dimensions of American politics. So let's look at what's happened in terms of where the parties stand on these issues over the last 30 years um, to the Jackson Pollock period. Uh, here I've taken data from the American National Election Studies, which are studies done every four years of presidential elections. They are the gold standard for good studies of elections. I've taken them from 1972 to 2004 in this case, but if I updated them, by the way, they would continue to look the way they look, which I'll explain exactly what the salient feature is in a moment. And I've got a bunch of lines, maybe too many. The solid lines are where the average Republican or Democrat people who in surveys said, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, where they stood in each of those years. So what you notice is in the early years, you get that bar right there on the left, the difference between the two parties. So what we've got is liberal positions at the bottom, conservative positions at the top on economic issues. So these are issues like redistribution, spending, and so forth. And what you see is there's a difference between the party. There's a wedge between the party in 1972 but look how big the wedge is today, a lot bigger. The parties have separated out. By the way, I did this at the University of Florida. I said, the parties have separated out. And everybody in the crowd went wild. And I thought, wow, you know, these people, they're really connecting with me. And then I realized why, because at the University of Florida, you said it over here, it's the Gators, and this is the symbol for the Gators. So I was doing the gator symbol, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. They started doing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but the metaphor can be completed in that what's happening is the jaws of the alligator are opening, which is probably bad news for American politics. Now, the other lines are for people who are in the parties but who are activists. They either give money or they give time to the party, donate their time, they engage in campaigns. So the activists, those are smaller percentages of the parties, roughly 10% of the parties. So let's look at activists over time. That's what's happened with them. They started out further apart than the rank and file, but they're even way further apart now. So it's not only that the rank and file have become more polarized, the activists have become way more polarized. Then now let's look at this other dimension, which is social moral positions. And basically in 82, or 72, it turns out actually in 72, social moral issue positions didn't matter much for politics, believe it or not. Uh, this is, by the way, the year before Roe versus Wade, the abortion decision. And these issues did not much affect people's votes or the parties. Uh, and as a result, there's actually not much difference between the two parties. If anything, the Democrats might have been more conservative on the social moral issues in 1972. So let's look at what's happened with those. There's the rank and file. They have gotten further apart. But now look at the activists, really further apart. This sort of accords with maybe what you might think you know, which is that the activists of the two parties have really gone to different positions on the social moral issues. If you're a Republican, you're anti-abortion, you're anti-gay rights, you're for prayer in the schools. If you're a Democrat, you're on the other side. So the two parties have sorted into two separate groups. Now, by the way, it's important to know this. You might say, oh, that means America's become a lot more divided. That's not right. Turns out Americans are not more divided. That is to say, if we look at the spread of issues, it turns out we've got the same uh, standard deviation or spread or whatever you want to look at as we used to have. It's not that Americans have become more divided. It's that they've sorted into the two parties. There used to be moderate and conservative Democrats. There used to be liberal and moderate Republicans. Think of Jacob Javits, Republican from New York, moderate, maybe even liberal, Republican. Think of Strom Thurmond when he was a Democrat, conservative Democrat. Uh, John Stennis, 
from Mississippi, people like that. There used to be conservative, moderate, actually there still are a fair number of moderate Democrats. There's more moderate Democrats than there are moderate Republicans. Uh, but still, the point is, the parties have been gone to their respective corners, sorting has occurred. The other thing that's occurred, by the way, is there's more independence. So people have just left the parties. So this polarization we have is really the result not of polarization in the sense of the Americans becoming more divided. It's the sense of the parties becoming sorted into ideologically more homogeneous groups. Okay, now let me just show you one more picture, and, and I'm sorry, I, I just love all these pictures, and I love this kind of art. But this one actually is the one that looks like the Calder picture. So along the horizontal axis, I have a question about redistribution of income and liberal position to conservative positions. Along the vertical axis, I have questions about social moral issues. And I've located where different kinds of people in the electorate are in a 2008 survey. And so this blue circle on the left is where Democrats and Democratic activists actually are. And the red circle way up in the upper right hand corner is where Republican activists are. And what you notice about this picture is if you look at where the citizens are, where the average citizen is, the Republicans are further from the center than the Democrats are far from the center. Now it's true we've had both sides going away from the center, but it's the Republicans who have gone much further away from the center than the Democrats. And it turns out no matter what measure you use, you seem to find this again and again and again. And the truth is, political scientists started noticing this about 10 years ago, but we were reluctant to say it because we sort of said, well, you know, maybe our measurements aren't that good, maybe this is true, maybe that's true. But the more we've looked at it, we finally come to the point where we say, guess what? The Republicans have really become a much more extreme group than the Democrats. That's not to say the Democrats are angels, they've become extreme in some ways as well, but it's the Republicans who have become most extreme. And this, by the way, is the theme of a book recently published by Tom Mann at the Brookings Institution and Norm Ornstein at the American Enterprise Institution. That's a liberal institution and a conservative institution. And Norman Ornstein has taken a lot of stuff for his position, but they basically say, you know, for years we were trying to say it was just both sides that were at fault. Now we're pretty convinced it's the Republicans who are the really, really bad players. And sadly, I think that's true. Um, and it's partly because the Republicans are a more homogeneous party. So conclusions. The mass public is polarized along two dimensions. Polarization really sorting between the two parties has increased dramatically. And polarization is greatest among activists and less among the mass public. OK, let me just do this very quickly. This is data on not the mass public or activists, it's on elites in Congress, members of Congress. And this is a picture of a just a one dimension, just one dimension, liberal conservatism. And what it does is the height of the thing here tells you how many members of the Senate or the House are at that particular location. So you find out that most uh, Democrats are liberals, big surprise. By the way, here, this is from Keith Poole, this person I mentioned who refuses to code uh, Democrats in blue. He has to have them in red. And so I took this from Keith's uh, website, the Ken Lay Professor of uh, Political Science at the University of Houston. And uh, so he's a conservative, by the way. And so he's pointing out that this kind of polarization has occurred. And there you get the Democrats, there you get the Republicans. And what you notice here is there's virtually no overlap between the two parties. In fact, it's now true basically that the most liberal Republican is uh, the most liberal Republican, let's say the most conservative Democrat is, is to the left of the most liberal Republican. So there's no overlap. And in fact, you can see this in Keith's data very nicely from these pictures. This is 67, 68. By the way, this uses roll call voting in the and Senate and House to try to code people and uses some sophisticated statistical methods to, to do this kind of thing. And what you notice is in 1967-68 there was overlap. See the top picture? Notice overlap. By the way, notice where John McCain was in his party then. Um, he was on the sort of right side of his party. Uh, then the 100th uh, Congress, then the 110th. And notice these things have just gone apart. 
Now there's virtually no overlap. And John McCain, by the way, has gone from being a conservative in his party to being a left winger in the Republican Party. So that's why I say, if you look at it, it's the Republicans. By the way, this is, again, Keith Pool data. This isn't liberal academic. And this is just a measure of polarization, which is basically the distance between the two parties. And what you see is it's increased in the House and the Senate over time dramatically. So we've got real polarization. OK, why? Well, one answer that may be cause, may be result, is more filibusters. This is a, a, a graph of the number of cloture motions. When you have a filibuster, the way you end a filibuster is you file a cloture motion, which is to end the filibuster. That's the first thing you do. You file a cloture motion. Then you may vote on the cloture motion. That happens in a subset of cases. Then finally, cloture might be invoked, and that happens in a smaller subset of the cases. So all three lines here measure various steps you can take. And you notice the important thing is all three lines, of course, are going up, and quite dramatically. Whereas in the 60s, we had really a handful of cloture motions. Now we're up to about 100 per session. OK. Elites are polarized along two dimensions as well. I actually don't prove that to you, but they're polarized as well, and it has increased dramatically. Okay, now let me just finish up by saying some about, something about the fiscal cliff, and I'll just say a word or two about Prop 30. <coughs> Why does this matter? Well, it matters because we've got this terrible problem looming. The fiscal cliff is a situation where the Bush tax cuts will expire, and some tax increases will occur, not many, but a few, because mostly because of Obama health care program. Expenditure cuts will automatically occur because of a process called sequestration that was the result of the 2011 agreement on the debt limit. Remember, there was the big fight, and we almost didn't uh, increase the debt limit. Well, that method of dealing with that problem is called sequestration, which is automatic cuts in defense and automatic cuts in discretionary spending. And then there's also expenditures that just have to be on a yearly basis reappropriated. All this will affect economic recovery. Because what you're doing, if you want to stimulate an economy, you either spend or you do tax cuts. That's what the stimulus of 2009 was about. The fiscal cliff is a situation where you increase taxes, that destimulates the economy, and you cut spending, that destimulates the economy. So it simultaneously does things in terms of increasing taxes and cutting spending that, as you can see, that person is really distressed with, uh, that will destimulate the economy. And by the way, if you don't think the stimulus worked, then you don't think the fiscal cliff is a problem. You shouldn't. Logically, you can't. You ha that's the only consistent position. So it is very odd to see. Republicans very worried about the fiscal cliff, but not believing that the stimulus worked. Just can't have one without the other. The stimulus, if it worked, fiscal cliff's a problem. If the stimulus didn't work, let's not worry about the fiscal cliff. Doesn't matter to destimulate the economy, because we know stimulus doesn't work. So destimulation doesn't work. And in fact, the amount, and this lists some of the things that go on in terms of billions of dollars, the amount is about $680 billion of destimulation, and you remember, the stimulus was about $800 billion. So the fiscal cliff, again, isn't a problem unless the stimulus was successful, which I think it was. And I think the fiscal cliff is a problem as well. Uh, by the way, one thing that makes the fiscal cliff even worse is this is not just a one-time cut. It's a continuing cut. By the way, one of the good things about this is if we do these things, we'll bring in a lot of tax revenues. We'll cut a lot of spending, and guess what problem we'll solve? The long-term debt and deficit. We'll get rid of our deficit problem, probably at the cost, however, of throwing the economy into a very big recession. And in fact, Moody's Analytics, Goldman Sachs, CBO, Congressional Budget Office, all predict that if the fiscal cliff is not repaired, if we, if we don't stop and not do some of these things, uh, we're going to end up with about a minus 4% growth rate, which is real recession. So the fiscal cliff will lead to real recession. So the trick here is to maybe, in the short run, not go over the fiscal cliff, but maybe somehow do some of these things in the future. Uh, by the way, 
I'm not going to go through all these, but these are all the details of things. And the important thing is the right-hand column. And to note that who wants to increase these taxes? Uh, notice Democrats want to increase some and Republicans want to increase others. So the parties have different perspectives. And by the way, what's the dimension along which the differences lie? Democrats want to increase taxes on the rich. Republicans want to increase taxes on the poor. That sounds like the parties I described earlier. Um, similarly, if you go to the spending cuts and sequestration, the Democrats are worried about discretionary spending, and the Republicans are worried about military cuts. So again, big differences in the two parties, big problem. OK, so as I say, if we do go over the fiscal cliff, and if we don't change any of it, uh, at least we'll get rid of the deficit problem in about four or five years. That's nice. Unfortunately, we'll throw the country into a big recession for the next three or four years. Big high unemployment, 11, 12 percent unemployment. So what's going to happen? Well, here's likely results of election. Obama president, I think, I've shown you that. Senate Democratic and House Republican. Uh, second most likely outcome, Romney is the president, but the Senate still is Democratic and the House is Republican. And I put probabilities next to each of these. Third, Romney president, Senate Republican and House Republican. 15% may be too high for that, but something like that. And then the last one, Obama president, Senate Republican, and House Republican, 4%. I think that's highly unlikely. But even more unlikely is that the House go Democratic. So let's take some of these first, these first three scenarios, which are almost all the probable ones, and ask what happens. Um, if Obama wins, and there's a Democratic Senate and a Republican House, I think there's going to be a budget deal going to take a while. There'll be some kicking of the can down the road. Uh, there'll be lots of squabbling. But in the end, a budget deal, because there's a deal that's possible. Basically, the Republicans are going to have to finally accept increases on taxes on the rich. And Obama will argue there was a mandate for him to do that, because he talked about it during the campaign. Uh, and then, uh, hopefully, uh, the Republicans in the House will agree to that, and we'll get some kind of deal. Um, if Romney is president, uh, I think there'd be under that second scenario with the Democratic Senate, I think there'd be some kind of budget deal, again, along the same lines. If Romney wins and there's a Republican Senate and a Republican House, so he has both houses, he won't have a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate, but he can use the technique called reconciliation, which is the same technique that was ultimately used to pass the health care bill after they lost the uh, election in Massachusetts, Scott Brown won. Uh, and I think Republicans will go on a tear and use reconciliation to make enormous discretionary uh, cuts in discretionary spending, uh, probably keep military spending high, uh, probably cut taxes, certainly restore the Bush tax cuts in every way, and so forth. So that's going to be enormous changes. So uh, let me just say one word about Prop 30. I must. This is the advertisement. Um, let me just show you this. This is what's happened to spending per pupil at the University of California and the CSUs in the last decade. It used to be at the University of California we got $24,000 per pupil for classroom instruction and other purposes. Now we get $10,000. That's more than a 50% cut. Tuition ta hikes have not but filled maybe half of that difference. So it's not like we have just gotten it all back in tuition hikes. They've been quite extraordinarily large, but they have not replaced all the state funding by any means. Yet, Berkeley especially remains a Cadillac product. We compete with Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. We do so at a cost of a Chevy. What you've got is a university which costs a Chevy price and produces a Cadillac product. I think that's pretty good, personally. Uh, Stanford is much more expensive than what they spend per pupil. One way to think about Stanford, Stanford's got a $20 billion endowment. They've got roughly a million dollars of endowment per student. That throws off about $50,000 per year per student. 50,000, that's just simple math here I'm going through. Maybe 45,000 if you think you're only going to yield 4.5%, something like that. That's a lot of money. My question is, why does Stanford charge tuition? Where is that money going? Think about it. 
And why, by the way, do we have 30, 35 percent Pell Grant eligible students, needy students, and they have 15 percent Pell Grant eligible needy students? I don't mean to pick on Stanford. I could pick on Harvard. I could pick on Princeton. I could pick on Yale. But this, and here I, I really do get into the advertisement, this is a great institution. This is a remarkable place. A Cadillac product at a Chevy price that's accessible to all parts of the income distribution. I would not be here today except for the fact that I got higher education. My father was a carpet salesman never went to college. I'm here today because I got a chance to get higher education. That's what the University of California does. If Prop 30 does not pass, we're going to have $250 million taken from our budget, $125 million in promised relief on tuition increases taken away, $375 million for the whole system. So, uh, the, the UC Berkeley's share of that is maybe $60 million. Uh, that's an enormous amount of cuts. $60 million on a, fac on a uh, student body of about $30,000 is about $2,000 per student. We're already down to $10,000 per student from the state. That's $2,000 more. When are we going to wake up in this state and realize we can't ask for something for nothing time and time and time again? If we want a great institution, we've got to pay for it. So by the way, I'm not allowed as a faculty member here at the University of California Berkeley to tell you how to vote on Prop 30. You may be able to discern how I feel about it. Thank you.